Yes. <laughs> the shield. That's so cool. We never really seen that. Hey guys, I just wanted to pop in really quick and give an updated reaction and my new thoughts on the new Prey trailer. So I've already seen the trailer, but I wanna watch it again. <laughs> Every time I watch something, I find a new thing about it. So let's just cut to the chase and get to watching it. And then after that, I'll tell you guys all the thoughts that I have in my head about this because I'm actually really excited. Let's give it a go. Why do you want to hunt? Because you all think that I can't. The way that they talk. I saw a sign in the sky. That's cool too. I'm ready. It's just native. <laughs> My boy, Nita. Doggy. Ooh, good shot. Just reminding me of the Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you don't see it at first. Because then you see it. Help. I'm coming with you. You can't. I'm trying to protect you. Protect me from what? Horror vibes. I like that. It's time. Good line. That shot right there, I really like. It knows how to hunt. I know how to survive. So badass. <laughs> oh. Editing is great in this. I can kill it. The shield. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the shield. That's so cool. We've never really seen that. Okay. God. Okay. Let's talk about it. So my first my first thoughts with it, they they're they already kind of setting the tone a little bit with uh, with our protagonist, who's played by uh, Amber Midthunder. And for the most part, most North American tribe who had hunting societies, it was usually the role of the man. And I know in particular in my culture too, it's, it's, it's particularly the male role. And what's interesting is she's definitely trying to break the norms and assert herself as, you know, a hunter. It's what she wants to be. And already, though, that, that thematic setup, you know, she wants to be a hunter. She wants to prove herself to be a hunter. And then contrasting that with the predator who is a hunter, like that line, they hunt to live, which is talking about, you know, the Comanche and pretty much all natives in North America, or everyone really at the time. And then talking about the predator, it lives to hunt, which is very in indicative of, you know, the predator society and everything. But I just think that's really cool that they set that up that like you know i can tell it's gonna it's gonna play around with that idea of hunting and i think it's really cool that again it's going back a lot for me and i think a lot of i think a lot of fans are understanding that like this is going back to the root of the predator franchise the original film was schwarzenegger they're, they're you know they're in the woods they're being hunted and chased like literally 80% of the film, they're looking into the trees. <laughs> there's a there's tension there. And, uh, and you know, the original Predator, I think, was a good mix between horror and action. Um, there's actually a really cool video essay by Patrick H. Willems, and he specifically talks about the Predator film and how it broke a lot of the norms of the 80s, and which is why it works so well. And I think with this film, they're going back to that. 
they're going back to form. It's like a stalking hunter vibe. And I know for a fact there's probably gonna be some scenes that are like really have a lot of tension and are pretty creepy. And they're going back to something that's just more primal. And I think that's one of the th things too that people really liked about the original Predator, especially the ending scene, you know, the ending sequence of Dutch preparing to fight the Predator. It's probably some of like one of the coolest montages I, um, I've seen. And it's just so like warrior inducing. And I think it's interesting that we're probably gonna get, hopefully, I don't know, that's just my, me and my personal whatever, but I hope we get something like that with this one. I've, there's a lot of criticisms about, you know, like how is, you know, this native woman gonna take on and kill a predator with just bows and arrows? Well, I mean, that's literally kind of like what Dutch did in the first film. He used a log, you know, <laughs> and he made a bow and arrow from scratch, you know? It's like, it. what's really interesting and cool, in my opinion, is what makes humans a formidable uh, prey or opponent for the predators is the fact of our ingenuity. And they touched on that in the, in the trailer where she says, you know, it knows how to hunt, but I know how to survive. And uh, she made that little cool weapon. Although I don't know how practical that would be, but it's still really cool. <laughs> that whole thing I just thought was really cool. And again, like I said, it's going back to what made the first Predator really great. And in talking specifically about Warrior Woman, uh, I see a lot of people criticizing, like, oh, they're going to try to make this, you know, just another female empowerment film. But I don't get the vibe from that. Really, I think they're really gonna try focusing on the character. I have a feeling they're gonna dive just a tad bit deeper into like why she's doing what she's doing and how, you know, why she feels like she needs to prove herself. And this, you know, this conflict between her and the Predator is definitely gonna be a way to prove herself and whatnot. And going back to whether or not this is ethnographically correct, there have been warrior women in quite a few native societies. And then even in my tribe, we had quite a few women who kind of just stepped up and decided to just take up arms. You know what I mean? So it isn't uncommon. This was definitely something that could have happened even at this time in the early 1700s. And it's interesting that they're showing the fur trapper. For me, I thought that was a very interesting take and kind of show maybe uh, the contrasts of how the Comanche approach this new foe as opposed to the fur trappers. But um, yeah, I thought that, I thought the, looking at that from that angle, in my opinion, is definitely very interesting to me. Talking about the franchise in general, I feel like this is, again, like I said, this is going back to what made the first one great, but after the last Predator film, this is just refreshing. The last Predator film, I wanted to like it, I just, I couldn't, <laughs> it was just awful. And unfortunately, I think what happened with the last Predator film, Fox and Disney are deciding to just put it on Hulu. I think they are underestimating the reception in my opinion. I've looked through the comments on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Reddit, and Twitter and Instagram. I've been looking at the comments and the majority of the comments are positive. The reception is good. and. You know, this is the thing that, you know, I've been saying for the longest time is that like, this is what needs to happen. This franchise in particular, I think is just, it's what it needed. It needed to just completely go back to like what made it good in the first place and play around with predators in time periods. And I think that's what a lot of people want to see because it's so cool, in my opinion, to see the ingenuity of our species. I think Disney and 20th Century Fox are making a huge mistake by putting this only on a, you know, Hulu original release and not in theaters. And uh, it's frustrating when other films, in my opinion, are getting theatrical releases um, that are eh, in my opinion, and this isn't, so there's that. Another thing that I think is interesting about this film is the cast. So uh, we have Amber Midthunder, and I think she is probably like the most I would, I would argue marketable slash most experienced actor in this entire film. She was in Legion. And then I think she was like Heller Highwater as well. So she's, you know, she has experience. But then we have like people like Harlan Blaine. He was in a couple, like a short film or like a, a indie feature. Dakota Beavers, I think this is literally his first acting role. Stephanie Matias, uh, same thing. Like she's very, I think she's only done one more thing according to IMDb. And then Stormy Kip, same thing. Like a lot of these main uh, actors and actresses for this show or for this film 
Um, this was kind of their first big thing. And I think it's a very interesting choice for me personally not to slap uh, a very well-known actor to this because I think it helps revitalize the franchise and it gives us a chance to just, you know, it gives the story and the franchise a chance. And, you know, the, the, the setting alone is enough, in my opinion, for people to get into it again and recognize potential new t native talent, which is, again, something that we are lacking right now is native talent. I complain about it a lot and, you know, I'm actually, you know, kind of going that route myself. I'm, that's why I'm growing out my hair. That, every, everybody is, uh, everybody is native. And I think that's just another thing that I, in my opinion, people are overlooking just a little bit is the fact that like this cast is new. And I personally think it's a, it's, it's an interesting choice to just put in fresh, fresh blood. <laughs> Onto, ironically, no pun intended, onto this onto this feature. I think it would have been really easy to put on some people that were involved in Reservation Dogs or uh, Rutherford Falls or like, you know, throw Adam Beach in there or West Studi or somebody. But like, they decided to go with uh, a lot of new people, which I think is really interesting. The other thing I wanted to talk about in particular was that the fact that like the Predator franchise already has an interesting relationship with native characters. So we'll go all the way back to the first Predator film. One of the characters in the squad is uh, Billy and he's played by Sonny Landham, who is, I believe he is Cherokee and Seminole. And in the film, he's, uh, I have a whole thing about Billy. Billy is an interesting uh, representation to me. He's very, he's very stereotypical, but at the same time, not. <laughs> he's the stoic, quiet, tracker i just the one thing i liked about the film is that it doesn't try to beat you over the head with it it kind of allows him to just be who he is at the same time he's just quiet all the time very john redcorn like billy you know something what is it i'm scared Pancho. bullshit you ain't afraid of no man there's something out there waiting for us and it ain't no man. He had an interesting moment in the first Predator film when, you know, he decides to go up against the Predator hand to hand with, you know, shirtless with a knife and he like bloods himself and everything. Like that whole sequence was cool. It's just unfortunate that we we didn't actually get to see it. Uh, unfortunately, the next time we see him, he's just, you know, plopped over on a tree and getting his skull and spine taken out by the Predator. But it's interesting that like that, it had that character and then you go to the i think it's the late 80s early 90s there was a comic which was later adapted into a novel it was called predator big game and it is about uh, a navajo national guard soldier stationed like in roswell and there's this predator ship that crashes and you know, of course the army is investigating it and everything Turns out the predator, of course, is there to, you know, hunt game. <laughs> and it, you know, it's going around killing people. But it, in the end, it kind of sets it up that he is going to be able to fight this predator. What is very cool and very fascinating, it, even now thinking about it, I think it's just one of the coolest ways of connecting native lore and science fiction franchises together is the fact that like this character, his name is Nakai. It, that's his like government name. His Navajo name is Monster Slayer. And he had a twin brother who died in birth named Born of Water. And Monster Slayer and Born of Water are the two hero twins in Navajo mythology slash theology. They're the ones who given charge by their father, the son, to go and kill a bunch of monsters. Monsters that were killing, you know, human, human beings. And one of these monsters was the quote unquote ho horned monster. I mean, no one really knows what that monster is, but this author kind of twists it around and makes the horned monster the predator, mainly because it's, it's you know, mandible. And the character Nakai is the alive twin. And then his brother is passed, but his spirit is like alive and around. And the author kind of, mixes kind of this spiritual mysticism mixed with sci-fi and it's actually really fascinating it does take a little bit again of that kind of the cheesy spiritual route that like his brother as a spirit helps him but like if you know anything about navajo spiritualism it kind of works <laughs> 
But anyways, it was a really good book. I would recommend it. It's called uh, Predator Big Game. It's a very interesting read. But like that was one big thing that happened. And then now we have this. And so I, for me, I think this is just a continuing legacy of natives being in conjunction with this franchise. And unfortunately, I don't think I see it going anywhere further than this. But like, I think this is just one of the coolest things. You could even as far to say that like, there are a lot of interesting native themes within the lore building of the Predator Society. The fact that they are a warrior society and that they uh, they blood themselves and they have clans and they have a, a kind of a chieftain style hierarchy, very similar to like maybe the Norse as well. And they, they just adopt a lot of that iconography, which I think is interesting. Even the design of this Predator and this, this film looks like it has a quote unquote tribal look to it. It looks a little more uh, down to earth, kind of like the original one was. It has like a skull that's a part of its uh, helmet and stuff like that. So they're really kind of leaning into that. And I think that's, in my opinion, it's somewhat a very, I'm reaching here, but again, it's kind of, I would say a somewhat interesting, maybe not as overt influ native influence on the Predator franchise. The last thing I wanted to talk about in particular is specifically why this film is kind of a big deal. Again, I'd argue that Rutherford Falls and Reservation Dogs are a big deal in their own. The difference here though, is that those shows are, first of all, they're streaming, specifically streaming TV shows. This one is a feature length film, but it is probably one of the largest I would say most profitable and marketable franchises to attach native characters and native talent. For me personally, this is what I've been saying for the longest time. If native representation is going to get try to get bigger and bigger, we need to start pushing to put uh, native characters and native talent, native writers, native creatives into genre films. And when I say genre films, I'm talking sci-fi, fantasy, horror, creature features, stuff like that. Those are quote unquote genre pieces or even I would argue in action, like stuff that's like, you know, very marketable to the rest of the world. And if you indigenize those things, those will definitely, people will eat it up. And this is the thing that like, in my opinion, is what a lot of native creatives need to do. And this is just personally my personal opinion, okay? But like, we need to indigenize these franchises <laughs> or something like, like it. Make some, indigenize uh, vampires, indigenize a sci-fi flick, indigenize horror, which is something that like Antlers tried to do and failed, right? And if, in my opinion, like this is the key, right? But I think this right now is proof to me based on the positive reception of everyone that has kind of been jaded by the franchise is that native and indigenizing certain things is very marketable and very appealing to people. As long as you do it right. Hey, come on! Open your eyes! And it just kind of goes in and crosses into the potential of, you know, indigenizing these things kind of comes a commodity, kind of like we were back then, it would be go full circle. But the difference is, is I think if we are in charge of our own representation, and in charge of how we are presenting ourselves. And I have a feeling that this film is going to try to allow native voices to be the forefront and be heard because, I mean, I only see one white protagonist and he, I think he plays a French fur trader. And so this is a film that is putting a native protagonist at the forefront of the action. I'm not saying that hasn't been particularly like done before, but like with a genre piece like this, no, we've, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this with this large of a release, with this big of a franchise, with this much money behind it. We haven't seen that. And that's one of the reasons why in my opinion, it's such a big deal. And the second reason why this is such a big deal is because they are also allowing uh, viewers to watch the film in Comanche. But I think it's gonna be more of a dub. But the original actors on screen are gonna be the ones dubbing. So the, I think we would get somewhat of a little more natural dub over. Either way though, this is the first mainstream 
giant studio backed film getting a native dub on its original release. Now I am, you could argue that, you know, Star Wars and Finding Nemo, they were dubbed in Navajo, but they were dubbed like years after. And, but Star Wars was probably the first kind of mainstream thing that had an indigenous dub over. That like, there's tons of indie films that are like in their native language. But when it comes to something like this, this big, you know, with something that's gonna go around the world that has a lot of money behind it, it has a lot of reception. The fact that it is in the Comanche language is like history. And I don't think a lot of people recognize that <laughs> yet, but I wanna get that into your head that it's, it's a big deal. It's something very, very fascinating to me to see. And I'm glad that the distributors agreed to do this and Hulu, but like, I, I think that's, that was a bold choice and I appreciate it. It makes me very happy. It makes me very optimistic for the future of native talent and native stories being told in this format into large spaces. Anyways, that's, that's just kind of my rant about it. So I'm excited. The film, the trailer, every single time, it just gets me excited. It just looks so visceral and it looks so just, ah, it just looks cool. It just looks like a very fun and cool film. And regardless if it bombs or not, this is still a big deal for indigenous representation overall. In my opinion, it would have been, it would have been way more groundbreaking if you know, the writers and the directors were all native, right? But that's just not the case with this one. And I understand why Fox um, didn't particularly do that with this franchise, but the director is competent. I really enjoyed 10 Cloverfield Lane. He is very good with tension. And so I think this film is gonna kind of capitalize on that. I'm really excited for it. This is just my re reaction as a fan of the franchise and also as, you know, an indigenous person, native person who, is very passionate about rep native representation. So I'm going to do a review on it for sure. I kind of really want to do that. This is a fun and interesting step in the right direction for native representation overall. So I'll see you guys in the next one.